Hey, Susie, just to say we're here um, and we will look out for the uh, panelists to arrive and assign them appropriately. We're all set. Sounds good. You can hear me okay? I can hear you okay, yes. And okay. we're recording already, so later we have to um, change, uh, you know, delete that part, but that's all. Normal. Good, yeah. Okay. I, um, just to let you know, and this shouldn't be a problem, but I can't, I've trusted a few times and I can't share the video. So hopefully I don't have to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Hopefully that's the case. Otherwise, you know, I can still read. But yeah. Yeah. We yeah. Be good. Okay. I be have good. it on. So. All right. Hey, Tamaya, I just would love to real quickly test that you are able to unmute yourself and turn your camera on. I'll turn my camera on too, just for a second. Hello. 
It works. Fantastic. I love it when technology works. Yes, le- likewise. Because I find so often it doesn't. So Right. <laughs> My biggest fear this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. But you know, we've all been in this weird virtual world for long enough that we all get it. So yeah, it's all good. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Wonderful. And we'll turn cameras and mics off until we begin. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Just a quick welcome to all our speakers. Thank you so much for joining. Um, we will begin at 11 o'clock promptly and um, you will be prompted as per script. And then if you would 
um, unmute yourself and turn your microphone on, uh, sorry, your camera on, that would be wonderful. So we'll see you shortly and thank you for joining. Hi, Nick. Hi, Dr. Pointer. So glad this is working. Um, How you <laughs> good morning. Thank you for joining. Um, we will start at 11 o'clock promptly. And um, hey, love. <laughs> um, then um, we will turn our microphones and video cameras on upon the beginning of the panel discussion. So you're all set. Thank you.
Well, good morning to all of our panelists and our panel host, Commissioner Miller. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we will start in just about a minute. Um, and welcome to all of our attendees. We will begin shortly. Um, until we begin, I'm going to share my screen and show a um, presentation, just quickly an overview. And um, all the panelists, if you would just uh, hide your video, or turn your video off until we begin in the panel, then we can see the, the slideshow. Thank you Thanks. so much. Good morning. Good morning. So it is 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all here to the day one of our 23rd annual Making Healthful Decisions Conference and our first virtual version of this event. This year's theme is Tools for Growing Resilience. And now that seems to be even more fitting than it was when the originally planned conference was scheduled for March this year. My name is Julika von Stackelberg. I'm with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Orange County, New York. And as one of the organizers of this event, it is my great pleasure to be here with you all. Before we begin, I want to give you a very special thank you to the team of organizers. Um, some of you have, some of them have been part of organizing this conference for many, many years. So thank you, Annie Colonna with the Warwick Valley Community Center, Susie McCormick with Cornell Cooperative Extension, Robin Rosenberg with Mount St. Mary and Stephanie Susnowski with formerly with MISN and now with Garnet Health. Their flexibility, support and planning are what got us all here today. So I'd like to walk you through what to expect during the next few hours and tomorrow. Um, we will begin with a dynamic panel discussion that will be followed by a Q&A you can submit your questions for that on through the Q&A feature that is on the bar um, that should be at the bottom of your screen. And this session will end at 1215, um, giving us all a quick chance to have a quick lunch or tend to whatever we need to do. Um, we will then return for two workshops that take place simultaneously either for tools for health and human services or for tools for the community. You should have received the link for whichever you registered for, as well as in the um, email that went out yesterday along with your confirmation. Um, if you need any assistance, we will be available via email during the break time. Um, best way to email is um, my direct email and we can put that in the chat as well. That's jv426 at cornell.edu. Um, and you should be able to find that in the chat. So I'd also like to take a moment and thank the New York State Parent Education Partnership, NICE PEP, for supporting this conference as a strong roots event, which supports parenting educators as well as parents and caregivers. And a very big thank you also goes to our lead sponsor, Garnet Health Medical Center, an important partner in our community when it comes to healthcare. And I am particularly delighted to introduce Dr. Gerard Galano to you. Dr. Galano is a practicing urologist and has been at Orange County for in Orange County for over 20 years. He's, he was the president of the medical staff of Orange Regional Medical Center, the chief medical officer and chief executive officer of Catskill Regional Medical Center, and is now the president of Garnet Health Doctors. His focus has always been to provide the highest level of medical care to the people of this community and has taken 
this level of personal responsibility to patient care to all of his leadership roles. And I am going to just stop sharing my screen so we can see Dr. Galano, welcome. Thank you so much. So, so I, it was truly an honor to be here uh, to welcome all of you to this important uh, conference and to represent Garnet Health in doing so. I'd like to thank the Julia and Cornell Cooperative for all the great work they do uh, related to health and well being, but also for their efforts to organize events such as this that provide needed information as well as a wonderful forum for us to dialogue. Uh, I know you'll find the speakers and the panelists uh, for this conference insightful and informative, but what I love most about conferences like these is getting to hear from the participants. Uh, there's great work that's being done by many and being able to speak with community members who are doing such great work, as well as finding opportunities to partner with them will allow us to achieve more than we can accomplish by ourselves. You know, Garnet Health provides wonderful medical uh, health care and behavioral health services, but it will be your efforts that ultimately move the dial related to community health. And understanding that this medium, unfortunately, uh, makes it difficult for us to network like, like we, no we normally would. I'm going to ask Julia, and, and obviously we put our information in when, uh, when we signed on, but I would like to share my contact information for because Garden Health uh, would love to uh, the opportunity to work with many of you, whether uh, those efforts are to improve the resilience and emotional well-being of our children or health and wellness in our community. We'd love the opportunity to provide as much support as needed. Um, uh, you know, I want to just talk very briefly about COVID. Obviously, it's uh, it's why we're on this uh this conference as opposed to seeing each other in person. We're seeing a slight uptick in positive uh, patients in, in the Hudson Valley. Healthcare wise, I think we have more than enough capacity. This is not the same as what we were dealing with in April. Um, Garner Health continues to see patients in the outpatient setting as well as through tele telemedicine when appropriate, but please continue to see your doctors at this time. Uh, you know, if, if this has taught us anything, it's really taught us the importance of maintaining one's health. Uh, once again, I want to thank you all for everything you do. And now I will turn things back over to Julia and, uh, and I will enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Galano. And I will um, put your contact information in the chat um, in just a little moment. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for this very warm welcome. So now I will um, attempt to play for you a brief um, presentation of, of our um, speakers today. So just bear with me for one moment um, so that we can introduce who you are going to meet today. Here we go. And now on to our panel discussion. In the interest of time, we have sent you an email with the biographies of our panelists, which we encourage you to revisit for reference of their work and accomplishments. Our host today will be Darcy Miller, Commissioner of Orange County Department of Social Services and the Department of Mental Health. Our panelists will be Shalane Garcia, a criminal justice program specialist for the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services, Office of Youth Justice, and Tamaya Memoli, Director of Program Development with Prevent Child Abuse New York, a nationally certified trainer for the Protective Factors Framework, as well as Nicholas Pantaleoni, Assistant Superintendent for Instruction in the Port Jervis City School District, and Dr. Alicia Pointer, who is Chief of Pediatrics at Cornerstone Family Healthcare and Director of the Star Foster Health Program, as well as Love Odi Kumui, who is a peace building and conflict transformation practitioner and the founder and director of Unceloid. And finally, Bishop James Rollins Sr., the founder and senior pastor of the Tabernacle Church, a multicultural ministry in Middletown, New York. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I would love to um, now hand this over to Commissioner Miller um, for our panel discussion. Good morning. If everyone who's on the panel can put on their videos, we can have you join us for the panel discussion. 
You look at what a wonderful introduction. You know, we're so excited to be here. We planned this uh, this conference. They planned to have this conference in March of this year, and unfortunately, the pandemic moved us to a virtual venue. Um, at this point, we're all getting pretty comfortable with doing things virtually, and we we might never go back to uh, some of our in-person meetings, right? Um, I really, uh, you know, have to say that we're so committed to the work that's being done through this resiliency project and thank Cornell Cooperative for their leadership, Yulika for her direction, for her organization and her guidance as we prepare our community to be much more resilient as we deal with not only the traumas of the past, but the traumas of today. So I am honored to be able to host this very, I think very elite uh, panel you all have incredible experience and we look forward to hearing what you have to say about the work that you're doing and how it impacts our community. So thank you so much for joining us today. If we could just start with having each of you go around and talk about your work, who you work with and how it impacts the social and emotional literacy of our community in, in the locations where you look, work and the people that you touch. So if we could just, you know, go in order as we are on the screen and have you begin, Nick, that would be wonderful. Sure. Uh, first, I just want to thank uh, Yulika and Darcy and all the fellow panelists and everyone here to join us today to really discuss this most important work for, uh, for our, our students in our community. So my name is Nick Penelion. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Instruction with the Port Jervis City School District. And, and really, I began my tenure with the district and really starting with embedding mental health in the K-12 curriculum, really by starting the development of mental health mapping committees along with character education committee, and really trying to have that be parallel to the core content that our teachers do an amazing job teaching each day. And really looking at the values of uh, not only the academic success of our students, but their mental health and well-being. You know, that really propelled us to really look at uh, the different intelligence of students and implementing kinesthetic learning labs, a really movement into our, our pedagogy and teaching, you know, across the K-12 curriculum in, in many different ways. We implemented a zero hour physical education program and really looking at to engage our students before the start of the school day, uh, along with creating positions such as a social emotional learning liaison that really embeds the New York State social emotional learning benchmarks. And really along with that, uh, really looking with working with Ulica, promoting resilience, the documentary, having all of our staff be trained in mental health, youth first aid, and really becoming aware of ACEs and what it is to have a student that's a four um, and whatnot. And then, um, you know, one of the keynotes today, Scarlett Lewis, we implemented the Choose Love program and had Scarlett's work within our district for the last several years and just really the powerful message of compassion, gratitude, and kindness. So that, those are the really cornerstones of our learning community. Thank you, Darcy. Uh, thank you, Nick. You've done incredible work. It's a pleasure to hear you talk about that work and the passion you have for the children you serve. Sh Shalane, good morning. Good morning, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, um, as Nick mentioned, to um, be here and to talk with you all all about the work that I'm doing um, on a state level um, to foster resiliency, particularly within the youth justice system. And so my name is Shalane Garcia. I'm a program specialist with the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services nestled in the Office of Youth Justice, which essentially is charged with providing resources and expertise to, to promote change and improve the quality of responsiveness to youth in the youth justice system from the continuum of prevention to reentry. And so when I'm talking about youth, previously, we really only focused about ages 7 to 15, which some of you are familiar with Raise the Age that occurred um, in 2018 and 19, which expanded that definition of youth to include 16 and 17 year olds. So when I'm talking youth now, I'm talking ages 7 to 17, essentially. And so part of the areas that sort of fall under my purview um, include working to reduce racial and ethnic disparities across the system trauma resiliency and healing, gender responsiveness and, or girls justice, working with disconnected youth, disproportionate school suspension and school justice, as well as serving as a liaison to three regional youth justice teams. One is with one of which is the Mid-Hudson region. Um, so full plate, but I got it. 
Um, so one of the ways that we really work to support um, social and emotional literacy is really through education and really diving deep to really help agencies and localities alike understand the need to be trauma informed. So in the crux of the, the uh, understanding criminal justice and youth justice, we know that the system over time has moved to being way more punitive and not really understanding the underlying trauma that plagues a lot of youth that enter the system. And so from its inception, youth justice was designed essentially back in the 1800s to really be rehabilitative because even back then, we understood what the brain science said about youth, right? About impulsivity and about development. But over time, it's all it's shifted to being strictly about what's wrong with these youth. We know with trauma-informed care that it's starting, we're starting to ask the question, what happened to you? So the work that I'm doing not only asks that question, but moves to ask the question, now let's focus on what's right with you. And let's build those assets to make sure that we can cut down on the recidivism or even prevent you from entering the system, period. So part of that, um, what's right with you is about the healing-centered engagement, which is what I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but yeah, that, that's the work that I'm doing right now across the state. Um, so I don't have a specific locality per se. Um, um, I've done work anywhere from Long Island all the way to Buffalo. So it, it really covers the entire state. Shalane, I know in Orange County, we appreciate those concepts as you're infusing throughout the system and raise the age scared so, so many people. <laughs> yeah. And here we are into it and doing so well with it. I know our collaboration with probation and mental health and social services in Orange County is really trauma-based um, and mm -hmm. acknowledging the experiences, the emotional experiences of our youth has made such a difference. So thank you for your efforts. Look forward to hearing more from you as we go forward. Thank Dr. You. Pointer, good morning. I, I haven't seen you in quite some time uh, since we began our um, increased collaboration with social services. So it's a pleasure to see you and have you joining us this morning. Same with you. So I'm Alicia Pointer. I work at Cornerstone Family Healthcare, which has multiple sites in Orange County and beyond. Um, at heart, I consider myself a community pediatrician but now as chief of pediatrics and director of our STAR program, my community has grown a little bit. Our STAR foster health program is a partnership with Department of Social Services. So we owe a huge thank you to Darcy for helping it, us get it started. And it's really a collaborative effort. So our team includes at Cornerstone, in addition to our social services liaison, providers, members of nursing, care coordination, behavioral health. And we realized pretty early on that in order for our program to really be successful, we couldn't just train providers. We had to train nurses. We had to train our medical assistants, all of the people who are seeing these patients who as scary as I am in the doctor's office, some of those people can be even scarier to our little kids who are already coming in frightened we've noticed as our tools for resilience have grown and as we've been developing those tools ourselves that it's spread beyond our star patients to now include our star families and our other patients and our other families, even if we don't necessarily know what their trauma is. So I hear my medical assistant say, oh, it's okay if she rips the paper on the exam table. She's just being curious. And that's her reassuring parents about a normal behavior and also really boosting the self-esteem of parents and their kid. That kid went from being a troublemaker to now being curious, which is very positive. Um, or I'll hear my nurse say, you know, first I'm going to clean your arm, then the shot, then the Band-Aid, then the sticker. And she's showing parents that you know, sometimes kids are more calm when they know what to expect and that there are some parts of routine, the sticker, that do make kids feel better, even if the pain part is sometimes unavoidable. So at Cornerstone, honestly, we don't talk a lot about social and emotional literacy, but we do talk a lot about telling families what they're doing right and what a great job they're doing and helping kids feel safe. So that's where we start. 
Thank you. You are a role model in how we bring the medical and behavioral health community together to make such a difference, not only in the lives of our children, but in our families. Thank you for that. Good morning, Tim. How are you? It's nice to have you with us this morning. Hello, hello, and welcome everyone. And thank you so much for, for inviting me to be a part of this day. I'm very excited to be here. So my name is Tamaya Memley, and I am the Director of Program Development at Prevent Child Abuse New York. And you may ask yourself, why is Prevent Child Abuse here when we're talking about social emotional literacy, right, and social emotional health? And my skin in the game is that in New York State, we're a statewide organization, in New York State, over 65,000 children are found to be abused or neglected every single year. Every year. Now that number may go up a little or go down a little, but it's always hovering around 65,000 children. <clears throat> that number fills Madison Square Garden almost four times, right? Every year. So when we were thinking about the work that we were engaged in at Prevent Child Abuse, this was several years ago, we began realizing that a lot of our work was focused on identification and reporting. We were focusing a lot on, a lot of our effort was on secondary and tertiary child abuse, rather than lifting our foot back over the fence into the world of primary prevention. So as we began to really take a deep dive into what that actually meant, if we were going to prevent abuse from ever happening, um, what, did, what did that mean for us? And so that led us to protective factors work and strengthening protective factors of families. And, and as we did more research and, and gained more knowledge, what we realized is that social emotional literacy is, is probably if we could only concentrate and focus on one protective factor. Social emotional competency um, is the golden ticket for kids, right? Social emotional competency, social emotional literacy is foundational for success in life. You, when you are socially and emotionally competent, you learn about and you understand your own emotions and the emotions of other people, right? So that leads to, that unlocks self-regulation of behaviors, that unlocks empathy, right? And all of those things unlock successful peer relationships. Um, we know that, for example, for young children, social emotional competence is an indicator of school readiness. We know that children even smaller, younger than kindergarten who are not social emotionally competent, preschool expulsion rates are astronomical, right? They're three times the number of kids K through 12, right? And if kids are not present, they're not learning. They're not learning all of those critical skills that are part of being ready for school. So our work at Prevent Child Abuse New York, um, for us, social emotional competence is actually one of the essential protective factors that we focus on because it helps keep families safer for children, right? Um, it, it reduces stress for families. When children are behaving in a way that's not challenging for parents, parents are going to have less stress. And our work um, at Prevent Child Abuse New York, you'll hear me say this probably a thousand times today, is tethered to two fundamental principles. We want to always be intentional about reducing family stress while we are simultaneously increasing parenting skills. Those two things. All the research tells us that that is going to keep families safer. Um, we know that incidents of abuse um, generally happen under times of intense stress. And we also know that those parents really love their kids. So what does that mean? It means that parents or families are under a lot of stress and they don't have the skill sets to appropriately process that stress that allows them to nurture their children. So, so we're all about building stronger families as a primary prevention tool. And um, as I said, social emotional competence is, is really foundational to that, so. My, the work that you do is so important to the work that we do at the Department of Social Services and responding to and building resiliency in families when abuse and neglect is present. So we look forward to hearing more from you as we go forward this morning. Bishop R Rollins, what, what a pleasure to have you here with us today. You know, our faith-based community 
is so important uh, because you have access to people that we never get the opportunity to connect with and you are often the liaison to connecting the community to the service system um, and, and really for uplifting a community and during this time of pandemic never more important than how you uh, you know spread hope throughout our community so thank you for being here with us this morning uh, good morning. Thank you so much uh, for the privilege and the opportunity to be a part of this august panel of uh, professionals and community leaders. Uh, I am eternally grateful, especially for Ulika and also the Cornell Co-op uh, facilitating this, this actual event. And I have to tell you that it is, um, it is certainly inspiring uh, I am Bishop James A. Rollins, Sr. I am the founder uh, and senior pastor for the Tabernacle uh, Church right here in Middletown, New, New York with my wife. Uh, we have a saying, our church is where the word of God is preached. It's where the power of God is felt. It's where the spirit of God is manifested, where the love of God is revealed and the unity of God is perceived. And our motto, of course, is we are not just another church. We have embarked upon an area of a multicultural holistic ministry uh, as a non-denominational ministry with the focus on reaching people and then, of course, teaching people. We consider ourselves a what we call a woke church, a church that is not uh, merely embarking upon the uh, conventional models of uh, simply expecting people to come to us, but to literally go to them. And so when we look at bridging the gap between the spiritual and the natural and engaging uh, social and emotional development along with, uh, uh, from a perspective of faith, uh, especially as we consider what we'll be talking about today as it pertains to adverse childhood experiences. I've had the privilege of simply saying not only to my congregation, but the community, you know, our focus is not on, <clears throat> our focus is not on in reach uh, or within the four walls of the church, if you will, uh, but on outreach. And so we practice leading by example. Our ministry is engaged in uh, being involved in the community in every aspect that you can imagine. We are working on a program, for example, called GROW, which deals with uh, re-entry of families that have been negatively affected, uh, especially in the minority communities or uh, some of our lower income communities and dealing with parents that have been set apart from their, ch their parents. Uh, children have been set apart from their parents. That's called GROW, which is getting ready for the outside world. We lead by example, I serve on the board for Dispute Resolution Center and have been for the past 13 years, uh, understanding things like divorce mediation and adverse childhood experiences certainly come into play when you talk about that. And I bring a unique perspective to that board because uh, I incorporate the aspect of bridging the gap between faith and uh, actual practice. And so, Dispute resolution allows us to do that. I also serve on the board of the Children's Rights Society for Orange County. So that also provides me a unique opportunity to be able to connect and understand what happens when children have to actually have legal representation that as a result of their adverse childhood experiences in some instances, places them on the opposite side of their parents in a legal environment. And so it is uniquely challenging, but I look forward to this panel discussion today as we work together to bridge the gap and actually fulfill what I call missions, you know, not only loving God, but the second greatest commandment, which is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So I'm really looking forward to this today as we incorporate the uh, empirical, as we incorporate the practical, the clinical, uh, along with the spiritual. Yeah, see, inspirational. Thank you, Bishop. What, what a pleasure. I look forward to our continued conversation.
Love, good morning. It, it is, um, I have not met you. I, I read your bio and I'm so impressed by the work that you do. And it's never more important than now. Our, our community is in such turmoil and your experience is just something that we'd all like to tap into, I think, every day, all day. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you for the introduction, Darcy. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here um, and hear from you all, the introductions have been great so far. Um, sounds like a lot of folks who are doing, if you will, the boots on the ground work. And I would say I'd like to think of the work that I've done. I've done that boots on the ground work as well as working globally. And my work right now is somewhat at this intersection of, I like to say supporting the supporters, helping those people who are doing the work to think about how to build their own resilience, think about those who they are partnering with, what education do they need? Um, I have been in the educational space and I know that sometimes there's a bit of a lag between the most, the most recent research driven way of doing things versus the way in which that has been like embedded in the culture. So a lot of the work that I am doing is in a bit of culture transformation, um, supporting organizations to really think creatively about how to use the practices that, that we know that work to really push the needle to get us to where we'd like to go. So I, I am the founder um, and the head of a consulting firm on siloed and on siloed isn't a word that actually exists, but if you think about the root of it, which is silos, it's really about breaking down silos of um, the way that we work in separation. So I think for a very long time, we've, everyone has thought of themselves as pillars of, you know, I do this and this is what I do and I do that and this is what I do. But there's a great need for interconnectedness. And I think even in us connecting in this virtual space right now really speaks to the importance of bringing our work together. Um, what Alicia might see in the doctor's office might be deeply connected to what um, Shalane sees in, in her work and what Nick comes across. And sometimes we're not able to connect those dots because we're not talking together in a constructive way that we need to. So um, my professional background is as a trained attorney and I sort of have spun out of that role and I use um, conflict resolution in a very creative way to get people to talk together so that we are not at that heightened state of crisis before we are sort of like in a war room situation. So I sort of like shifted out of that litigation war room space to say, I think if we dial this back 10 steps before and we are using the skills and the methodologies that are really important to bring in community together, um, then I think we can make a lot of progress, whether in sharing information, building resilience and thinking about those people who we care about in the communities where we work. Um, the last few months that has looked like a lot of folks who the light bulb has been turned on in relation to thinking about diversity and inclusion. And I've been working across multiple organizations to help them just to fast forward that process of now you know, what do we now do? How, how can we do this differently? How can we have more healthy outcomes for the people that we care about? And how can we bring a new lens to the work that we all are so passionate about? because the truth is there's work that we do and do so well, but some of that work because it's so grounded in a colonized way of doing things might be re-traumatizing folks because they don't recognize that they might be perpetuating harms in those ways. So that's really what I focus on. Um, I, I really enjoy it because there's a lot of creativity and I can work really across sectors um, and across communities to just bring that sense of interconnectedness through the work that I do. So a real honor and pleasure to be sharing with you all and thank you for hosting. Darcy, I think you're muted. Yeah, the, the challenges are virtual, right? You have your emails flying in, you have, you're, you're trying to mute to make sure everybody else is clear, but we're, we're getting through it. So, so love, thank you for, for that inter, those introductory comments. Um, the interconnectivity is so important to us. And, you know, although we think that we're hitting the mark every time, we, we aren't always. And um, really the diversity of experience and opinions and understanding is what makes us whole. So um, thank you for reminding us of that. 
look forward again to your continued comments. So uh, Yulika has prepared some questions for us and I will move forward with asking those uh, questions. Please add into the discussion what you think is pertinent and um, I will begin with Shamai and really asking you to speak a little bit more about protective factors that you've used in your work that have been incorporated and implemented that you think have had the greatest impact. Great, thanks Darcy. So protective factors they're really the center of all of our work at Prevent Child Abuse New York. Um, we believe that all members of our communities need to be grounded there. And, and when I say communities, I mean all levels of folks in our community. So um, I'm talking about community members, I'm talking about folks who work directly with families, and I'm talking about the organizations who employ those folks who are working with families, right? Um, anybody who's coming into contact with, with children and families really should be grounded in, in strengthening protective factors. And so that means that our work is actually across sectors. You know, for a long time, we talked to our traditional partners, the folks in the early childhood world, um, the folks in the child welfare world. Um, we began developing relationships with with the K through 12 world, but we've also, you know, we've we've done protective factors work and trainings for for law enforcement. You know, we had the opportunity to train all of the training cadets at the city of Syracuse Police Department. Like, how how awesome is that to ground police officers in in strengthening protective factors? We've worked with attorneys who are now working with um, survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Um, we have worked with pediatricians, pediatric practices, and we train the residents at Albany Medical College every year, the pediatric residents, because it's so critically important that they are really intentional about strengthening the protective factors of the families that they're work, working with. And as, as we've done all of these trainings and had conversations with all of these different folks from these different sectors, what we've also discovered is that we, we often set unrealistic expectations for staff who are working with families. And it, we found it's unrealistic to expect a provider, a teacher, a doctor, a receptionist um, to work to strengthen the protective factors of a family that they work with. If they're working for an organization that is not intentionally strengthening the protective factors of all of their staff, we're immediately setting them, sending them out into the world with a disadvantage. And so we've begun working with leadership of organizations. Um, like, what does that look like? How do I do that? How do I, there may be fiscal ramifications um, and implications to strengthening protective factors of my staff. How do I, how do I bring my board along? So we've started having those conversations with leaderships of organizations. And then one of the other things that we've learned along our journey around with protective factors is that, you know, the, the perspective shift that is the protective factors framework, that shift in intention, um, does not actually spend a lot of time talking intentionally about what this looks like. It doesn't demystify the theory and the ideas of what we need to do. So, so we've begun working with folks to do just that, to demystify what this looks like for you tomorrow, right? And so I loved the story, um, the anecdote that Dr. Pointer shared about giving a shot to a child, right? That, that little snippet that takes 15 seconds um, provides so much for that family. Um, it teaches that mom so much. So that's exactly the type of thing that we've been begun working with organizations around. So, so let's, let's, now that you're grounded in the protective factors, let's come back and have intentional conversation about what our actions look like. Are we unintentionally adding to the stress of a family, right? We do that all the time. Everybody who works with families unintentionally adds to their family's stress. You think you're making it better, you're trying to make it better, and you know what? It's an epic fail every day, right? So what happens when we do make a mistake with a family? Are we immediately accountable as providers, as organizations? Are we apologizing to families? Are we working with them to hear what might work better, right? Are we open and receptive to that? And then what are the skills that are required of staff? Like how do we help staff build that muscle memory to step forward in a way that is rooted in intention, um, in actions and in words? So, so that's really, I mean, protective factors that is that is our work <laughs> and so that's how it's it's deeply impacted all of the trainings we develop all the relationships we have um, across sectors with folks across the state so 
to my, you know, everything you said just fits so beautifully with our Welcome Orange initiative, our comprehensive continuous integrated system of care, which we have just um, redeveloped and redesigned our charter, which many of our contract agencies will be signing. And the, um, the foundation of the work that we do is based in exactly that. First of all, we make a commitment to do no harm. Um, and I appreciate that. Uh, but, but how do we do no harm and how do we do better uh, to have healthy outcomes? Um, Dr. Pointer, what does what Tamai just talked about, how does that impact you and the work that you do and, and how you provide services, not only you directly, but to your doctors across your, your practice? So I think, you know, unless you're lucky enough to be a resident who's trained by Tame, I think that concepts like strengthening families and trauma-informed care can at first be very intimidating to healthcare providers. You know, every kid is different. The management can seem really complicated. We may not feel like we have the tools needed to help these families. The protective factors really give us a framework for how to start addressing these issues. You know, I could say the same thing about a kid who comes into me with a leg injury. You know, how it happened may differ. The management could be really complicated. I may not have the expertise to fix it there myself. But as a healthcare provider, I don't say to the family, sorry, I can't help you. You have to go home and take care of this on your own. I start with the basics. You know, let's take your weight off the leg. Let's give you some pain medicine. Let me see if this is an emergency that needs someone else that's not me right away. And as Tama A just said, you know, the protective factors, those are the basics for us. Those are the basics for families who come to us, you know, looking to strengthen their families, looking to address trauma, to prevent or help with these adverse childhood experiences. The protective factors really remind us that yes, Every child and family is different. But what I try to realize and what I hope that my providers realize is there are some things that all children and families need. So all kids need to feel safe. All kids need some routine. They need to hear more positives than negatives. All families need to know who they can turn to if they need help or if they need support. Those are things that I can start talking about at one visit without feeling overwhelmed. Sometimes it's even more basic than that. You know, sometimes one of the protective factors I'm working on is very specific in a very specific time. So we talk a lot about how can I help a child feel safe at bedtime? Or how can I help this one family get the food resources they need? You know, just like with a leg injury, everything's not going to be perfect at the end of that first visit, but hopefully some healing can start. And that's how we talk to our staff and our providers is by saying, you don't have to fix everything at once, but you can start. You can start with the basics, choose one of the basics if you want, and, you know, try to address it at that visit. You know, that's our job in healthcare just as much as treating injuries or treating colds. I really hope that when families leave our office, they leave with a couple pieces of knowledge. One is that trauma is treatable. And like with other things in healthcare, we're going to work together as a team to get through it and address it hopefully with other members of the team too. And two, families are already in my office. They're already talking to me and willing to discuss with me how to make their family stronger. They've already started the hard work of addressing these challenges. They're already doing a great job starting there. Dr. Porter, we know kids are in three places. They're in schools, they're in their communities, and they're in their pediatrician's office. And if every experience in a pediatrician's office could uh, include planting seeds 
and um, encouraging growth as, as you have, what a difference it could make. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, Shalane, you know how much that kind of work prevents um, youth from coming into the juvenile justice system, right? And your, your work has is incredibly um, impacts you know, what happens if they do come in. So as you are implementing healing-centered approaches in the work for youth, can you tell us a little bit about those healing-centered approaches and how um, they are implemented and impact the work that you do? Absolutely. So it, it's great that we're talking about protective factors because like I mentioned before, a healing-centered approach or healing-centered engagement really talks about assets and protective factors. And so over the past few months, um, we've spent some time under the tutelage of Dr. Sean Ginwright and the Flourish Agenda, which is an organization based out of California, who's developed this concept of healing-centered engagement. And so when I did my opening, I kind of mentioned that it was our goal to be able to move the system from not focusing just on um, what happened or what's wrong, but really focusing on what's right, right? That and building those protective factors and understanding the assets that these youth and families and communities actually have to offer. And so healing-centered engagement really acknowledges that there are some limitations to just being trauma-informed. And that in addition to being trauma-informed, there really is a key healing component that people need to explore and it needs to be focused and, and be more holistic in treating trauma. And so the argument for really looking at healing-centered engagement in the work that we do is that trauma-informed care really requires us treating the individual, whereas healing-centered engagement really looks at exploring those root causes, which really could be driven by a person's environment their community and things of that nature. So it really introduces the importance of looking at not just individual trauma, but collective and generational trauma. And so again, it moves past just looking at the individual. One of the things that I really appreciate about healing centered engagement really is that it focuses on fostering possibility or well being and not just treating pathology, which is the trauma. So it's not just about the symptoms that we want to treat. It's really about the well-being that needs to be fostered to avoid the cyclical re-traumatization that one could experience just by walking out the door in their neighborhood or going to school every day, especially when we're talking about youth. And so one of the final things that I really share about um, healing centered engagement, because it's, it's really a meaty framework, um, but one of the things that I appreciate most about healing centered engagement and I think that it's incredibly important in, in the work that we all do is really acknowledging the necessity to really look at, at the practitioner and make sure that they are fostering their own healing as they foster the healing of others. Um, and so what does this look like in New York State? Great question. <laughs> we're not sure just yet about what this really looks like, but we're committed and we've, we've set on this path to really figure out what this looks like. And it starts with education for us um, and getting people to understand that there is more than just trauma-informed care out there. And for me, in my particular work, it really hits home for me um, with, the, with my work with young women in the, youth, in the youth justice system. National research really tells us that girls enter the youth justice system with much higher ACE scores than boys, and that treatments that are effective for girls are not necessarily effective for, uh, for excuse me, treatments that are effective for boys are not necessarily effective for girls because they don't take into consideration that social emotional component that really is necessary to discover the root cause of the system entry for girls. And that's really just one example as to why I drive this sort of work um, within our office. And so over the past few months, our training was open to partners across the state um, and a few organizations and agencies will be selected as pilot sites. Um, so what that will look like is first understanding what policies and practices exist that are not that are or are not trauma informed within these specific agencies, right? You got to know where we're starting from. You got to see what exists, what's there, what are the mindset of the workers, what is the mindset of the clients that you're dealing with. And so, secondly, um, we have to work on that mind shift, right? As much as we need a policy shift to look at the policy practices and things of that nature that exist, we also need to understand that there has to be a mind shift, a mind shift into understanding healing-centered engagement as a relational framework. 
And it gets even more difficult when you have to foster that mind shift on higher level executives who may be kind of stuck in their ways. Um, so that becomes very interesting, even in beginning stages of talking about this. And so work has to be done to really shift individual perspective into personal relationships within an organization, as well as the policies and practices and also in order to foster a total system change. So we're really at the early stages of this. We just started kind of learning um, and getting that deep dive into what healing centered engagement is in uh, September, I believe. So from now until um, and, and into 2021, we're really looking um, into really what this would mean agency-wide, right? Because I work at the state level. So what does this look like in an agency? And how does the shaping of this in an agency really translate to practices down on the ground level? And so um, it's really important work um, that I really, really appreciate being able to do um, because I, I really love the fact that we can begin to now switch from focusing on the problem with our youth and really focus on cultivating the possibilities in our youth. So, thank you. Jelaine, thank you. Um, just let me tell you that Orange County is always open to um, pilot and support your work. Um, you know, we, we believe very strongly that everybody has a story and it's our, our job to, to ask about their story and to listen. Um, so, and we, we've created a single point of access for youth, um, bringing in our three main departments, mental health, social service and probation and a, um, our providers, really with the, the foundational understanding that we need to come from the perspective that you've just described. So really appreciate the work you do. And, and I think five, 10 years from now, um, it will make a huge difference. And so it's it's important. Thank you. And speaking of five, 10 years from now, Nick, you have implemented Choose Love through um, K through 12. I've had the honor of hearing you, hear you talk. When I, when I first moved to this county almost 20 years ago, I was a clinician in our Port Jervis Mental Health Clinic. And, um, you know, to learn about the community there and the uniqueness of Port Jervis, uh, some of the challenges to that community are, are very isolating by the experience of where you're located in relation to the county, but inspiring from the, um, the heart of the community members and what they bring forward. And your school district is really a foundational piece of that. Um, just walking into your buildings with your red lacquers just it, it brightens your day. Um, so, so appreciate um, the work that you're doing. I just want to make a quick mention too of the Handle with Care um, that you are um, considering taking on there as part of this resiliency project overall in the county. But bring a chief warden and Department of Mental Health and your school district together. So if police have had intervention with families at 2 a.m., they're calling the school the next day to say, listen, we were out with little Johnny last night and we just want you to handle him with care today. That is incredible collaboration. So um, Nick, please tell us what, what have you been able to document so far with the work that you're doing and what do you expect to see in five or 10 years with the foundation you're developing? Sure, thanks Darcy. You know, I think first and foremost, which you know, many of our panelists are really, you know, referencing today really starts with, with education. And, you know, I mentioned in my introduction, the trainings and efforts uh, that we really take seriously in implementing for our staff, uh, not only our teachers, but, you know, our custodians, our clerical in terms of training them for mental health, youth first aid, and, and knowing, you know, the importance of the resilience work and, and ACEs and whatnot. The next part is really embedding that of ideas and concepts into curriculum. Uh, really being mindful of creating a culturally sensitive curriculum and really ones that we really embrace all of our different stakeholders, all of our different diverse cultures. So we've made uh, you know, many efforts to reach out to community partners like the police. Uh, most recently, we've organized forums for Executive Order 203, uh, which Governor Cuomo released in July that you know, really local police and municipalities need to uh, really make make uh, changes in or in their potential procedures um, in in light to the recent violence that have been taking place. So we organize a series of student and uh, really community forums with the local police of Deer Park and uh, also Port Jervis and Chief Stinder and Warden did an amazing job in really having some honest conversations in how 
really that our students understand community policing and the, the police really understand, you know, the feelings of our students. You know, beyond that, we've, we've taken uh, really great strides in cultural competency and increasing diversity into our learning community. Um, Yulika was uh, kind enough to join a book study. We're leading a book study with our, our staff on Stamped, which really teaches our, our staff the, the values of, of sy systemic racism and also implicit biases. And, you know, this gets turnkey to our students in terms of our best practices. And when we, uh, like our social emotional uh, program, Choose Love, which Scarlett Lewis will talk about today, you walk into any classroom, you'll see on the board, the learning target. It's, you know, not only instructional, but it's, it's, it's really tied into social emotional learning growth. I can, we talk about I can statements in a school, but a statement you'll see is I can choose love. You know, I can express compassion and gratitude and so our students have been doing an amazing job um, in the programmings that we have and, and along with our teachers. So we have you know, many great things going on in, in, our, in our learning community uh, that we're very proud of. And we just, uh, we're proud to be part of the resilience uh, community uh, and Yulika for her you know, consistent involvement with our, with our kids. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I think that we, we will see a, a change in how your community comes together um, based on the foundational work that you're doing. So thank you. Bishop Rollins, your church was one of the, the first to take on the resiliency education and mission. And um, we thank you for that and being a role model. Um, how do you think that that impacts your community? Um, and what do you hope to see come out of it? Well, uh, again, thank you, Darcy. It is critically important. The church, uh, our church, as I said, we our motto is we are not just another church, takes the responsibility for recognizing uh, the church's role. When it comes to people, you know, in our communities, the church has to lead the way in terms of dealing with the evolution uh, of the growth and uh, development of the family and as a result, that impacts the evolution, the growth and development of the communities. And what we find is that, for example, I'm listening to each of you as practitioners uh, in your respective areas and how it all plays out. For us at the church, it actually begins from the very beginning and we cover, uh, it's a multi-dimensional approach because we have to cover both sides. For example, if you talk about adverse childhood experiences, we have to deal with both the child that has experienced that, that adverse childhood experience. And then we have to deal with the reconciliation, the re uh, restoration and the counseling perhaps of the person that may have committed that uh, cause or been the root cause of that adverse childhood experience. You know, and it all is filtered around what goes on in the community. For example, when we talk about well, we have a social justice ministry. If a child, you know, that's going through divorce, I'll give you an example. I've got a family right now in the midst of COVID. Uh, and I say to people, for example, COVID is probably the classic contemporary example for us right now of what our communities and our children are having to deal with in terms of adverse childhood experiences. I've got a family where five members of the family uh, were positive. That includes a child that was nine years old. That includes a child that's seven years old. Here's the dynamic of what we have to deal with or what we find ourselves dealing with in terms of resilience. That family comes because COVID doesn't come and just move everything out of the way. It comes alongside what's already going on. For example, the family is going through a divorce. So the grandparents are involved in trying to facilitate and mitigate and minimize the adverse experiences of the children because the mother and father are going through a divorce. And so the grandparents are literally providing virtual, a virtual environment because the children can't go to school now and they have to balance the, the behaviors of the two children and their ages uh, as they strive to actually continue to grow socially and emotionally. Now, while this happens, I just had to deal with this situation where the mother contracted COVID, 
She said, for example, to the father, because they're going through a divorce, don't tell the children that I have COVID. And what happens is the father, because he's going through the pain and the anguish, he tells the child that the mother has COVID and the child then calls the mom and says, mom, people die from COVID. Are you going to die? So now the stress of this mother trying to deal with having COVID and dealing with their children at the same time, the grandparents having to be involved and they also have COVID and the children know it. This is what it looks like when you take on the responsibility of being uh, the covering the spiritual side as the church. All of these things come at the same time. COVID didn't come in and move everything over. It, come in, it came in and stood alongside. It's now standing alongside the divorce issues that are taking place in the family. It's now standing alongside the economic challenges that the family is experiencing. It's now standing alongside all of the emotional issues that the family has to deal with. And then what we end up doing is we literally filter it all through our biblical worldview. And as a ministry that's focused on social justice, all of the things that are taking place in our community, we even have to deal with the people like yourselves because you also, each of you as, a, as practitioners also have a worldview and there's a spiritual side to your life. So when you look at what takes place and what we do in terms of resilience, we are excited about leading the way so that other members within the faith-based community can understand the importance of social and emotional development and how to bridge the gap in terms of their spiritual connection. Boy, are we lucky to have you out there in the community making these kind of connections and supporting people through such difficult times. Thank you, Bishop. Love you. Um, you're known for peace building and community resiliency building and constructive conflict resolution. You know, how do um, your practices um, interweave the social emotional learning and trauma informed care concepts? Certainly. So I think um, I, I really like the theme that is running through all the pre presenters here. And it's not just about the practices, but being able to teach the practices to those folks who are doing um, the work at the front line. So um, a key aspect of when we think about conflict resolution is just recognizing that to be able to be constructive um, and have creative decision making if we're still in that mode of trauma or fear or flight or fright, it's really challenging. And that's what the science says. It's really hard for our fright brains to be turned on at the same time as our creative decision-making brains. And sometimes we're asking people to do that hard work of while they're still in trauma, like asking hard questions. Like that's probably not the most productive way to engage. So I think there's just some space for us to think about, um, you know, while we might want to say, you know, someone should have autonomy, depending on where they are, depending on the his history, um, if they are probably have been historically marginalized in addition to the immediate trauma that they're experiencing, they may not have the level of agency and ability to self-express, right, in, in the ways that is formally understood by lots of folks around them. So I think um, a key aspect of the work that I do is trying to figure out when people are not um, in that space of wholeness to think about which one, what processes most suit them. Um, I've been really been a strong, more vocal in ensuring that practitioners are not um, funneling those who need your support through the practices that they know best, but really connecting them with the resources that they need best. So what we are doing shouldn't necessarily just serve um, you know, you shouldn't just be doing service to our calendar to say, hey, this is a project that I work on, so I'm going to use this method and process um, in this situation. It might not be best suited. So as a conflict resolution practitioner, I've sort of extended my practice in a way where I can be, um, I, I might 
see a scenario and decide, well, this is more fitted for restorative justice, right? Like this is not a mediation situation. This person might just need some one-on-one -on -one conflict coaching as opposed to saying, well, this is what I do and this is what's gonna fit this situation, right? Like that might do more trauma to um, the people involved. So it's really about being more focused um, and thinking about, especially in the work environment, those who are doing this work, making sure that they're feeling supported. And I want to make a specific distinction here also, as we think about resilience, we have to be cautious of mistaken trauma for resilience. I think for those, and, and I'm sure I'm not speaking to this group, but like a lot of folks who are doing this work, um, whom we may be partnering with, because for generations, um, historically marginalized groups, if you will, have almost um, developed that hard-worn, callous hands and feet that you get from just like doing the hard work. And sometimes that can be mistaken for strength. Sometimes that can be mistaken for um, like the strong black woman, or, like you have it together. And, and sometimes we may be seeing this with kids because I, I, I don't really work directly with kids. I work with young people um, at times, but oftentimes we can see this manifest in the work environment with the people who are doing the work, the teachers, people um, within uh, corporate environments. And it's, I think it's really important to lift up where people might need to feel supported. And a key, key thing that I used to lift that up is to think about psychological safety and the importance of creating a psychologically safe spaces. And really my question for anyone who I work with is the question of, do you feel like it's too expensive to be yourself here? And if you can't answer that positively, and there are some folks who can answer that, they don't feel like it's too expensive to be their self, their, them, themselves in a, in a certain environment. And you know, we then recognize this is where some of the disparities then begin to show up. Because again, if I were to even dive deeper into that sense of safety, there are almost there are four prongs to it. Like, do you feel safe to speak? Do you feel safe to learn? Do you feel safe to challenge the status quo? Do you feel safe to contribute in this environment, right? Like you might feel two, but not the other two. Like you might be feeling all four, which again begins to bring, show up some of the privilege that might be ex might might exist. So a lot of what I do is like in facilitating dialogue is to begin to dig into what might get in the way of us contributing, what might get in the way of us having constructive, difficult conversations that gets us to the next level, what might get in the way of someone challenging um, the person who supposedly has power in the room um, to say, well, this isn't working for me, right? Because if we're thinking about a trauma-informed approach, and if we know and understand that when people are in that state, they might have a harder time challenging the status quo just by the nature of what they've experienced in their whole lives. So not assuming that everyone will have voice in the same way or have the ability to just advocate for themselves and to begin to think about what do people need to be their whole selves and what do people need to feel supported and creating that in a way that is um, conscious of the historical um, challenges and traumas that they may experience, they may have experienced, whether themselves immediately, but or may have been passed down generationally and they've come to understand that are that is part of their, their culture, right? Like knowing that you've been raised in an environment where you've been socialized to understand that these are the parameters of what you can say or not say, or you can behave or not behave because you know that there are repercussions if you go outside of those margins. So those are some things that I, you know, try to weave into that trauma-informed approach in terms of just like thinking, you know, we might think, well, if you have two folks in the room who disagree and I am a mediator, I'm, I'm, I'm being a third party doesn't just necessarily balance out and create a level playing field. For some folks, that level playing field just does not exist. And we have to be more conscious of the ways in which our presence or not presence might be tipping the scales positively or negatively for one set of persons than for the others. Love your your words have resonated with me on so many levels. As a um, as a leader over a department of so many staff, you you have just um, reminded me of some really important questions as we try to understand the disparities that we know exist 
even though we intend for them uh, not to be present. They're, they're unavoidable, um, but we cannot ignore them and we need to find better ways to um, give pe people freedom to advocate and, and use their voice. So thank you for sharing that, so, such important work. That takes us right into, I, I think what's gonna be our final question. Uh, you know, I think this panel, we could continue this discussion for hours because you are, are all so impressive. Um, but really when we think about and acknowledge the effects of oppression, so so such as racism and sexism and classism and ableism um, and, and so on with individuals who have experienced uh, long-term health and well-being. And when we respond to that with the trauma-informed approach, strength-based approach, where we're basically saying what is strong with you rather than what is wrong with you, you know, what is your story? Um, what, what do you think and how do you think that could change our community? Um, and each of you, if you could just take, you know, 30 seconds to respond to that, um, but changing the approach and how we ask the questions, how we connect to our communities, how do you think that would make a difference as we deal with the isms that we struggle with every day? Uh, I'll jump right in there, Darcy. Um, you know, when I think about it, there is a very, uh, again, you'll always hear me say, I filter everything. While I may not, I always strive to ensure that I don't come across as hyper-spiritual or so spiritually minded that uh, I'm no earthly good. Uh, but I filter everything through my biblical worldview, and that is, of course, the word of God, because I found it to be um, uh, very extremely accurate. Scripture reminds us this, for example, that there is nothing new under the sun. People will always be people. People have always been people. And there is, uh, for example, a very wise man by the name of Solomon who said, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But there is a particular passage that says, um, you know, um, it, it, that if you, when you start thinking about the, how we ask the questions and how we deal with those things, it's extremely important to take, take into consideration, uh, you know, exactly how those things are done. And so it is a, a very wise man by the name of Paul who says it this way that kind of uh, lays it out uh, and I'll paraphrase it. If a person is overtaken in a fault and that fault could be uh, not understanding racism or systemic racism or the denial of it. But if a person is overtaken in fault, those of us who are spiritual, in other words, those of us who are mature and, and, and can actually look at it from both sides, restore that individual with a spirit of gentleness, restore that individual with a spirit of consideration, uh, thinking about the very fact that it could actually be you. And so when you start approaching it that way, when you ask the question, you know, it comes across in a completely different way. And I'll give a real quick example. Uh, I'm dealing with a young man who was charged with statutory rape uh, and his entire life has been changed. He's 28 years old now. He spent 10 years in the prison system and he got there because when he was a senior in high school, his girlfriend was a freshman. And they of course loved one another and they still love one another. How do you deal with a family, for example? He's now 28 and he's been in the prison system for 10 years because he was charged with statutory rape. He's listed as a sex offender. They were 14 and 17 at the time. And so now they are 28 and 25. What does their family look like? How do you deal with them because now they've got all these traumas. He doesn't trust anyone. I've had to counsel him in terms of dealing with thoughts of suicide, you know, her feelings of ambivalence and feelings of guilt. You know, her parents were the ones who actually initiated the rape charge. And whenever his picture comes up through DMV or the local police departments every year, because no matter where they live, no one knows their story. Those are the kind of things that we deal with, that I deal with from my end. And so I'd love to hear and see how I um, 
uh, serve as a facilitator because I have a quick reference guide. Who do I direct these individuals to when they, uh, what they need transcends my expertise uh, as a pastor in this community? Darcy, I'll jump in as well. I, you know, and, and I think that Bishop Rollins had many good points. You know, in speaking from an educator standpoint, I think it's really a, a three-pronged approach. And, and first and foremost, realizing, you know, one's own implicit biases, you know, that we bring to the table. And what are those conversations that we have with our children and, and, and really, you know, generational, how to break that cycle. And then also, you know, really recognizing in the media uh, instances of biases and stereotypes that exist, you know, in the past and present, you know, in a, in our book study, we, we, we spoke about, you know, the, the role of the Rocky movies and it's stereotyping Italian Americans and many instances of in literature and media. And, and really third is really looking at, you know, in terms of curriculum, the concept of mirrors and windows and really teaching our, our students of, you know, what they read in terms of finding a character that they can reflect, you know, their own self but really, really extending that out to windows, how do they really look at other cultures becoming really cultural, competent and sensitive to one another. So really bringing that back together, realizing their own implicit biases and, and the first and, and foremost to really break those silos as uh, Love spoke before, really looking at instances of media and that we're exposed to each and every day and how to have those honest conversations with our kids and colleagues. And then, you know, lastly, really exposing diverse literature for our students to really grow up and really understand, you know, how they see themselves, but more importantly, you know, how do they see other cultures? Something that we did is implement diverse literature in all our libraries. For example, that, you know, that if you're living in a mobile home, what is some literature that really reflects that from socioeconomic standpoints or, or gender-based or LGBTQ? And we want to understand that, you know, there's, there's literature for each and every one of our students that, really applies to. Well said, well said. Um, I think, you know, I think if we do acknowledge the effects of oppression and look at this, what is strong with you approach, you know, I don't think there's a part of our community that wouldn't be affected, you know, healthcare, juvenile justice, schools, I would hope that a lot more families would feel comfortable with the healthcare system that has honestly failed them and let them down many times before, you know, for many black parents, this perception of what's wrong with you starts before they even give birth. Um, as Tame said earlier, you know, I have yet to meet a new parent who doesn't want what's best for their children. And imagine if they knew from the beginning that they had a community of support working with them to make those goals happen. I think Love made a really good point that sometimes we think we know what other people need and I find that I'm still surprised by how much I can do when I ask families, you know, what do you need now? I think in healthcare and a lot of fields, we think we have all the answers, but I find that a lot of times families know what they need. Um, I had a family the other day who had some financial insecurity as many families do during this time. I thought they needed food resources. We had this new food and security initiative at Cornerstone. And they said, no, we're fine there. Our school's helping us with that. I said, well, what, you know, what do you need? And they needed diapers. Well, we have an amazing diaper bank in Newburgh. I could give them the contact information for that in 10 seconds. Um, but that wasn't something that I would have thought of on my own. I was so focused on what we were doing and what our initiative was. And I think, you know, I know Love, Shalene, Tame, I think have all mentioned this within our organizations too, that in order for us to make a difference with our families, we need to ask people working in our organizations the same thing. You know, what do you need now to keep yourself safe and strong, you know, to help your own families and to do the good work that you do? And even as individuals, I think we can ask that same question you know, what do I need now? Um, and why we, you know, we might not always get it. I think we'd be surprised by how many times, you know, we can get what we need and then be able to give that back to families. 
Before I turn it over to Yulika, because we have run out of time, I, I just want to um, respond to um, um, Bishop's Rollin, Bishop Rollins' request for help. 311 is a 24 7 crisis call number in our county, providing support, referral, very connected. Uh, we have conversations with them every week to be sure that we are all on the same page and what resources are available in the county. You can always call the Department of Mental Health as well. And um, the story that you shared, is very sad, and I know there's always so many sides to a story, um, but the, the outcome of that experience is heartbreaking. So I'm glad that they're there getting the support from you, and we'd like to help in any way we can. So thank you for letting me host this panel, and I turn it over to you, Lika, for final words. Well, thank you all so very much really, to this distinguished panel. I appreciate this so much, and I'm um, also Commissioner Miller for your Grace in hosting this conversation. And I think, you know, as we can see, um, we ran out of time so quickly. Um, we really have just began to scratch the surface of the conversations that really are need to be ha had and um, the lessons we can teach each other and what we can learn or want to learn where the opportunities really are to see possibility, right? And so um, I want to invite all of you who are with us today um, to continue to stay connected um, for the conversations this afternoon, as well as tomorrow's keynote with Scarlett Lewis um, on Choose Love. And then also in the coming year, where we will continue to host a series of webinars in collaboration with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Delaware County um, on a monthly basis. So uh, save the date every second Thursday of the month um, from 3.30 to 4.30. In the afternoons, um, registration will open soon and you will all receive information. But um, we really thank you for joining us today. I want to um, thank you again and hopefully the panels uh, or the uh, workshops this afternoon with Tamai and Love. You should all have your links. Um, double check your emails. And um, we really want to. Um, continue with this wonderful work and partnerships that are forming along the way. So thank you all so much.